name is Nate Sanders. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Artifact. I'm excited to be at Front. Uh, I have a quick confession, though. I think Front is the second best event to happen at Eccles this year. The first is, of course, uh, the Bluey play that happened here about six weeks ago. So, yeah, it's my people, it's my tribe. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Um, about three years ago, my company that at the time was called Motif was navigating a pivot. And uh, ironically, that same year, we were a sponsor for uh, this, very, this very conference, so it's fun to be back. But uh, at the time, Motif, what we had built is we had built this suite of tools to be able to help facilitate the synchronous and asynchronous uh, process of uh, primary research for product teams. So for instance, you could send out this asynchronous video survey to your customers. You could collect these context-rich responses from them and then share some insights with other stakeholders by just you know, highlighting a portion of the transcript and sending it over to somebody. Our pivot was really motivated based off the fact that we had observed through customer interviews and customer discovery that a huge portion of the market had become inundated with qualitative data but was really struggling to be able to actually utilize or measure almost any of it. And if, if you think about the whole customer journey, there's all of this really rich information coming from customers at every single stage of the customer journey. And most of it goes unused um, and underutilized. When we uh, were navigating this pivot, I had an early conversation uh, with a UX director at Allstate Insurance. And one of the things that uh, she said to us was this quote you see on the screen, which is, I need another qualitative data source like I need another hole in the head. Can you please just help me get value out of the information and the data that we already have? So as we navigated this, uh, it was very clear, and as we had conversations like this, it was very clear to us that there was this emerging demand, I'll be a nation, uh, for some sort of analytical system that could centralize and analyze every single thing the customer says across every touch point in the customer journey. So as we uh, got started um, with the pivot and started to be able to move through um, these different aspects of the hard decisions of trying to understand where we go next, et cetera, um, we took a very deliberate approach to be able to document what our known knowns were and what our known unknowns were. I'm a really big fan of at the beginning of any sort of initiative or venture, being very deliberate about uh, staring at the assumptions that we make as a team head on. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with this framework based off the fact that uh, Donald Rumsfeld in 2002 used it. Uh, watch this really quick. Reports that say there's that, that, that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because as we know there are known knowns there are things we know we know we also know there are known unknowns that is to say we know there are some things we do not know but there are also unknown unknowns the ones we don't know we don't know does anybody remember this yeah so a lot of people uh, considered this a rhetorical gaffe uh, called it word soup uh, I'm not here to convince you any other way. But the fact of the matter is that this process of looking at assumptions head on and documenting what your known knowns are and your known unknowns is a really effective way to be able to stare at what is uncertain, what is risky, and be deliberate about going about uh, proving those things wrong or correct. Um, one of the biggest known knowns for our team was the fact that at the time, three years ago, Modern text analytics was incredibly uh, hard to take action on. There were not a lot of expressive topic models or powerful topic models that made it easy to be able to understand or interpret what a topic was even about. And it was even more, uh, I think, uh, a stretch or a reach to be able to expect that a team could use that information to be able to set a company strategy. 
And uh, these topic models, they've been around for about 80 years. And the, the methods that were leading at the time when we were starting this pivot uh, were two main methods, term frequency models and word embeddings. And the way that term frequency models work is they break down a very large corpus of documents of text, and they split them into these specific and unique word parts. And then it calculates the frequency or the multiplicity of how often those words occur in a document of the corpus. And the deduction is that if a particular word occurs more frequently, then the subject matter has to align to that given word. Now, these methods power the vast majority of every single word cloud that you have probably seen and laughed at throughout your entire career. And they're very brittle. It's hard to be able to understand nuance. It's hard to be able to understand semantic similarity. And as it occurs, those are the two things that actually make these sorts of uh, insights actionable. The other method um, was a technique that's actually very powerful. It's called word embeddings. And the idea with word embeddings is that it calculates the probability that a particular word will co-occur against another word. And by doing so, you can create these very complex relationships. And using vectors, you can now do these mathematical operations over something that is actually textual data. So the really trite and common example that's used in the NLP space for this is that you can take the words around king, subtract the embedding space around man, add the embedding space of woman, and get two words that are generally talking about queen. These are incredibly powerful techniques that still power uh, a huge portion of the market today. For example, one of the most important underpinnings of large language models like GPT-4 is word embeddings. They're, they're very important. They're still very powerful. But the problem is that when you use them on their own, they still create these very terse and hard-to-action topics. And that was essentially the status quo at the time of uh, what the industry was experiencing, what they were using as far as text analytics. So we, we have these known knowns about what the state of text analytics was and what that looked like. And uh, one of our biggest unknowns was the fact that we didn't know how we were going to actually go out and build this new type of topic model that we had uh, a vision for. And we knew what it needed to look like. It needed to be verbose phrases that could be deconstructed to be able to help teams actually have clarity around what is the customer saying and what do we actually go do about it. And to be able to illustrate uh, how big of an unknown this was, my clicker will work, which it is not. <laughs> All right, maybe the crew can bring me out another clicker. There we go. Never mind. Um, I want to I tell you a story about an experience I had meeting uh, with Gunnar Carlson. And Gunnar Carlson is one of the world's leading and most published topologists and mathematicians. He started a company called AYASD that used and leveraged a method that he invented called Mapper Function. He's also a uh, Stanford professor. We met with him in 2020, and he was very gracious and took about 45 minutes with us. And about 35 out of that 45 minutes, he spent asking us questions about the different methods that we had attempted and tried. And as we answered his questions, he paused and looked into the corner of his office and said, yeah, very interesting. I don't think what you're trying to do exists yet. So you have this world-leading uh, expert in the sorts of techniques that we were looking at telling you that what you're about to go try um, with a team who are not mathematicians and topologists doesn't exist yet. It's pretty daunting. So as I look back at the last three years, our team has benefited and um, endured a lot of black swan events. Um, things like the pandemic, uh, you know, economic turnaround and recessions, um, you know, hard fundraising economics, things like that. And uh, I can really confidently say that our team would not be here without quite a few instances of luck and coincidence and serendipity and a lot of the AI research boon. And there were a few, fe uh, few behaviors as I look back over the last three years that helped us succeed that helped us make it through and actually navigate the different situations that we were going through. And I want to share four of them with you today. And as I, as I look back, these things have really become mental models for me about how I think about building AI products 
And I'm gonna try and share these in the context of how we moved through building our product over the last few years. The first is mutual dependency. So at our team, um, one of the things that we've encountered is a bit of a paralyzing paradox where when we start to be able to build new features, there are times when the product team needs to be able to understand what's possible before they can make a recommendation around what they actually want to go build. The research science team needs to be able to understand the product strategy with a high degree of clarity before they can actually help the product team understand what's feasible. And it isn't that the product team doesn't understand the problem that they want to solve or that the research science team doesn't understand the applied science that's available. It's the fact that there's this information asymmetry between the two teams that seesaws back and forth. So for us, um, one of the really clear deductions and strategies that we've found is that we have to be able to involve the research science team early and often. And that comes as probably no surprise to anyone who has been focused on cross-functional teams over the last you know, five to 10 years. But uh, there's a tendency in research science to be able to retract, to be able to work in silos. And I'm gonna talk more about that here in a moment. One of my good friends, Andrew Carr, uh, is a senior research scientist at Gretel. And I was asking uh, Andrew about whether his team experiences this problem at Gretel, and he explained that because their product leadership consists of AI PhDs and people that have had quite a bit of extensive experience in the AI field over the last 20 years, that they have been able to avoid, uh, for the most part, this paradox that I'm describing to you. And the point isn't that every single AI product needs senior AI staff from deep tech AI labs. It's the fact that because their product leadership had research science experience, they were able to empathize and understand the complexity of solving AI problems. So there's a bias on their team for collaboration because they respect one another's craft. And that is a heuristic that we have had to learn and enforce through organizational design, et cetera. One of the things that we did early on that I wish I could have gone back and changed is that we had the two teams of a product trio and the research science team working independently initially. And as we started to be able to see these problems arise more and more, we quickly realized that we had to be able to align these two different teams and we actually had to enforce them working cross-functionally together by embedding them into a single team. One of the other methods that has helped us to be able to avoid this paradox is a pretty frequent focus on working dimmable software. So one of the practices uh, that we have at Artifact now is we have a routine that we call memos to demos. And the idea is that every single Monday, our team writes a memo regarding what they want to go build and then demo the subsequent Monday. They outline the risks that they see, the unknowns, the work that they actually want to achieve and the tasks that they currently know will actually help them get there. And then they do everything they possibly can to be able to have a demo ready by Monday morning. And the status of these memos isn't a traditional Kanban backlog in progress and shipped workflow. It's more focused on the risk that the current memo has from being able to be demoed the following Monday. So why, why is that? What's the disparity? It's not that our team doesn't have a focus on getting uh, you know, software shipped to production. We still have a strong bias for moving, uh, moving efficiently and getting uh, this information out, or these uh, products out, excuse me. But the ability for us to be able to focus on risk and to be able to focus on what's going to prevent these teams from uh, getting something demoed on Monday has allowed us to be able to bring the teams together and have really hard conversations about what's missing between the two teams, what's holding them up, and what information needs to be shared so that they can, they can ensure uh, both are succeeding as they move forward. Um, the other thing that this has enabled us to be able to do is be able to avoid a term that uh, I've started to be able to call asynchronous dissonance, and uh, I have a confession to make, um, and it's that I made this term up, and I hope that one of you have already sketch noted this. So, um, The idea with this term, even though it's a made-up term, is the fact that the amount of time that it takes 
for an application to get to production is probably not going to be the same amount of time that it takes for a machine learning model to be able to be trained and released in production. So over the past eight years of my career, uh, especially, I've seen our industry focus and devise a lot of linear processes that are trying to facilitate this really tight harmony between dual track uh, customer discovery and delivery. And that's great, it's, it's an awesome thing. But when you're building complex products that have a lot of unknown variables to them, it's not something that you can easily extract predictability from. Instead, you need to be able to optimize for clarity and clear communication between your teams. So rather than a bias for how do we get this thing out in a predictable fashion and streamline these efficient processes, we've had to be able to embrace a little bit of chaos, uh, which we'll talk about here in a moment, and make sure that we are clearly communicating with each other to be able to efficiently get these, uh, these hard problems solved. One of the things that has helped that, as I mentioned, is these clear communication protocols. And this takes us back to this concept that I was mentioning earlier of memos to demos. And in our early projects, some of the earliest demos that we see from our teams are data prototypes. So we sometimes will see things like streamlit applications that get built or weights and biases training runs that we're able to see the initial preliminary results. Uh, or a Python notebook. Anything, it doesn't have to have a pretty UI, it doesn't have to be fully functional yet, but anything that can get the team to clarity around what's possible, what's working, what's not, we put an enormous amount of focus on. And because there's that dissonance between the amount of time that it takes for a machine learning team to be able to actually get their work into production versus the application aspects getting into production, very commonly, this work starts before a product designer ever starts designing something. And this allows us to be able to have critical conversations about what's working, what's not, catch early miscommunications, have these aha moments around what might be possible or where we should focus next. And regardless, it's allowed us to really avoid this, uh, the problematic aspects of when you have two different teams that have maybe different timelines of getting their work in production. The fact of the matter with this uh, chaos that I've been describing to you is that you have to embrace it. It's not something that you can avoid um, when you're solving these really complex problems. And as we've navigated this, we've had to be able to focus on being open with new ideas, and wherever they might come from, being open to the fact that we're going to have to chase new directions at any given point in time, and uh, which leads us to kind of the new um, meme that I want to talk about here, which is negative entropy, which just means that you have to be able to embrace the chaos and chase after these new ideas. Um, so instead of resisting the chaos, you need to be able to um, acknowledge the fact that there's going to be uncertainty in how you actually go about developing these AI products. And if you can adopt a more flexible and adaptable mindset, it's going to allow you to be able to be open to where the next direction might go, uh, the next iteration, where ideas might come from. I want to give you an example of how this evolved for us for one of the components of the topic model that we were creating, which is unsupervised clustering. And that's just a big fancy term for the fact that we can, without having supervision or instructions or humans being involved in the process, we can have an algorithm group uh, different aspects of text into these very semantically tight-knit groups of, uh, of text. So one of the first methods um, that we wanted to be able to try was something called symbolic graphs, and another contender was a method called hierarchical clustering. And one of our research scientists uh, that was early on our team had experience building uh, something called knowledge graphs, which gave him experience with one of the methods, and so we started to be able to focus there. And what we did is we built these uh, machine-generated summaries from specific document or interactions. So that could be something like a Zendesk ticket or a survey response or something like that. And we created these directional graphs. So if you see the arrow up there, that means that each one of these documents had some sort of relationship to that summary. So our deduction was, well, if you have these directional relationships, then all the different documents that have directional relationships could technically be part of this cluster 
of things that are similar to each other in a topic. What we quickly found out is the fact that uh, there are so many nodes and so many edges in these graphs that it's completely unfeasible to try and actually understand what's going on in the information. This is an example of one of our early customers where there were tens of millions of customer conversations that spanned tons of different edges and nodes, and it just became intractable for us to be able to try and do this. So that led us to a new type of uh, method where you have to actually understand the relationships between these nodes and these edges in the graph. We reached out to one of the world's leading um, experts in knowledge-based construction. His name's Andrew McCollum. He works at UMass. I sent him an unsolicited email asking for help. In fact, I sent four before he ever responded. And then he finally responded with some research that has, uh, was preprint that hadn't been released yet uh, to the public or been peer-reviewed that he was giving us that talked about a method called box model representations, which you could use to be able to do these clustering techniques that we were hopefully trained to accomplish. They look a little something like this, where it builds these hierarchies of relationships in a graph. And what we quickly found out is that that wasn't possible because we didn't have enough semantic information inside of these summaries to actually use these methods. And at the same time, as we were navigating the complexity of the fact that we couldn't use this method, I was introduced to a very talented genetic research, uh, genetic researcher at Flatiron, and he explained to me that he thought there were similarities between text clustering and DNA knots. And I didn't know what the heck a DNA knot was, and he explained to me that DNA is not this really elegant helix like we're all used to seeing in images, but when it occurs in the body, it's this really complicated, wound up knot, and they all have classifications and unique signatures to them. So if you can understand that signature, you can maybe map that over to text. As we were learning these different techniques that we could use to be able to do that, we learned about a method called persistent homology. And what persistent homology does is it allows you to be able to understand the shape of a graph over time. And it produces this really interesting fingerprint that are called barcodes. So if you see the blue lines at the bottom, Every single graph, as it evolves over time, has this kind of unique fingerprint. So if you match up the fingerprints, maybe that's how you could cluster it. I reached out to one of the leading persistent homology professors. His name is Henry Adams. He's at Colorado State University. And he quickly explained to us that that was a pipe dream because it's too incredibly expensive to compute in the amount of time frame that we needed. We need to create these insights every day. It was just impossible for us to be able to compute that in the amount of time that we wanted to. But he told us, if you take those barcodes and you flip them upside down, they're actually the same thing as the original technique that we were going to try, which is called hierarchical clustering. So in this big, circuitous, roundabout way, we had to be open to just an enormous amount of ideas. And we built a huge knowledge framework of what worked and what didn't. And it wouldn't have been possible if we weren't open to this chaos I'm describing to you. We had a ton of new ideas coming at us from all over the place. We had to traverse those in an efficient way. And I just really don't think it would have been possible without us being open to the fact that uh, new people, new energy, new ideas is going to help us get to where we want to be. Last meme I want to talk about is the map is not the territory. So the way that we think products are going to get built, um, the processes, the plans, the techniques that we think are going to work are very often not uh, applicable in every single different situation. In the same way that a map might omit or simplify details of a terrain, we have to be open to the fact that our past experiences and the methods that we know well might be biased by the fact that they worked in one situation, but they won't work in another. In 2020 to 2021, we had a 20 month period as we were working through these different methods that we frankly felt like we were lost in the wilderness. We were trying to traverse a ton of different techniques. At one point, we were very tempted to just settle with a word embedding topic model. We felt like it would underserve our customers, that it didn't move the industry forward. It was this underwhelming status quo. And we had a lot of our team members that were starting to see some tension based on the fact that they had built previous solutions based on those word embedding techniques, and I found them to be uh, underwhelming every single Monday morning. As we kept pushing forward, and we were open to the fact that maybe the experiences and the methods that we have tried in the past weren't going to be applicable in this new situation, 
after a lot of setbacks, a lot of experimentation, we were eventually able to be able to find our path forward and to be able to create a very unique topic model um, during that time frame and release that in 2021. I want to talk uh, just at the end here about how I think our maps in the state of uh, AI research and some of the new things that are being created here are about to shift in a pretty profound way. It's pretty clear to me now, even though I'm not, I don't think I have the intellect to be able to predict the future, that AI is going to progress in some pretty profound ways. Right now, we're in the kind of first phase where we're seeing this really interesting amount of reasoning happening. And the next phase to me is stochastic AI where AI is going to be able to go out and perform a task for us. It's not going to be completely self-governed or autonomous, but because of its reasoning power and its ability to uh, use computational power to solve problems, it'll eventually be able to solve these tasks for us. So my sign-off thought that I want to leave with you is if these AI systems become increasingly more capable of carrying out these tasks in an autonomous way, we're going to use them less. How will we as product practitioners measure adoption and engagement of products where the retention curves are expected to plummet? How will we measure value? The analytical systems that we're used to using, like Amplitude, might shift. Maybe it's more something like weights and biases over the next 10 years that our product teams are actually more invested in looking at. I'm really excited to be able to be open to the fact that these uh, techniques and the things that we know and use today to be able to succeed are most likely going to change and we'll have to be open to the fact that we'll have to navigate new terrain as we step forward through these AI products. So, thank you. There hasn't been a lot of questions, but we'll let, a, let that like settle in for a minute and I got a couple for you. Okay, great. Um, how, uh, how much of your focus at Artifact is focused on AI versus other product uh, innovation or development? Yeah, so I think the, the unique aspect of Artifact is that AI, um, not the models themselves, but even the user interface, you're actually interacting with the model. So it's a huge portion of our everyday work. Um, so 90, 90 plus percent of the product that we build at Artifact is a direct interaction or representation of the AI that we build or utilize. So we utilize methods like GPT-4 um, and other techniques and lots of open source methods and ones that we've created ourselves. But yeah, it's a huge portion of the work we do. Cool. Um, uh, you're a designer who turned CEO. How was your background in design helped you succeed? How yeah. Was? Um, when people ask me what I do, it's very common that my first response uh, in my mind is a designer. <laughs> um, I think the premise that designers have this unique ability to be able to look at problems uh, in a unique way and go think about it through an empathetic lens to be able to think about them in a human-centered way uh, has dramatically helped me think about business problems in the same way. So I, I don't know that there's that many dissimilarities, honestly, um, outside of you know maybe some of the tensions around visual design that we talked about here earlier, and I think uh, during Nate's talk, um, that can be hard to navigate. But a lot of the methods and techniques that designers use to be able to go build really great products, I think, um, also can be used to great, build great companies. Um, but I mean, jury's still out with us. We're early stage companies. So we'll see how that works out. <laughs> That's great. Um, why do you think that use of AI will plummet over time? So if you think about the fact that if a AI system will increasingly become more autonomous and more capable of carrying out a particular task for us. Um, in my mind, that means that the interactions that we have are going to be less about taps and funnels and swipes. And increasingly, it's going to be about authorization. So you and I are going to have more opportunities to authorize uh, artificial intelligence to be able to carry out a task in the preferences and ways that we would like it to, rather than us carrying out the task ourselves with, you know, usual user interfaces. 
And if that's the case, then that inherently means as AI becomes more valuable, that we use it less. So there, there's a huge boon right now around ChatGPT, but it's because you have to prompt it to be able to do anything. But as these methods become increasingly more powerful, you're not going to have to prompt it through every single step and task. It'll recursively be able to understand what did Nate want me to do, and am I doing it correctly, and what's next, and what's the next part of this task. So the, the amount of touch points that we have with it should go down over time, which I think presents this interesting dilemma that I talked about of how do you measure success of an AI product if it's supposed to be used less frequently. Yeah, I see. Um, with that, like with the popularity of AI in recent months, um, there seems to be a culture vibe that every company needs to start evaluating an AI strategy. Um, and skill set, what are your thoughts? Should every company uh, be exploring how to util utilize AI in their product? No. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think there are an enormous amount of industries that have tasks and value propositions that will be affected or influenced by artificial intelligence. And if you can reasonably make a good case for the fact that you're in the crosshairs of that, then yeah, you should be considering how you can leverage AI. Um, but I think there are lots of different software applications and products that um, don't have the same urgency or the same value add from it. Um, that could certainly change over time, but I, I, I regularly talk with other founders all the time about the fact that they need to slow their roll and focus on their existing product a little bit more. Yeah, you'd mentioned the chat GPT um, uh, that rolled out, and it feels like every company now is like, we've now integrated or partnered with chat GPT. Um, uh, do you have any comment on, in, in your opinion, the, how that has like changed the, the way companies see value of AI within their product with the chat GPT? GPTs in particular? Yeah. Um, the, the plugins movement that you saw with GPT is interesting because a lot of that is accessibility of data, um, making you know, your, your own proprietary data modes accessible to this ability for this model to be able to reason with it. Uh, I, don't, I don't, for instance, Klarna or Shopify. I, I, I don't know that ChatGPT has dramatically shifted how they think about AI or their own strategies for it, um, but it's it's obvious that having you know a narrative-based conversation with some of those areas can be very beneficial. So I I, I don't know. I don't know that it um, in that sense. I don't know that that like integration in that way or ChatGPT has um, dramatically shifted people's strategies. I think what we have seen pretty strongly over the last eight weeks is that it's opened up a level of accessibility and understanding of what's possible to a lot of different folks. Um, it's pretty regular that we have people that come to us and say, hey, like, I've been thinking about this space quite a bit. Um, we, we have a, a champion at Wayfair who came to us and said, I've been using ChatGPT, and it just has me thinking that if I could load this information in into a model like this, all the different customer conversations and think about it through this lens, like that could be really powerful. So those sorts of interactions I'm sure are happening for a lot of different companies that it's just become more accessible, more prevalent, more zeitgeist driven where there it's just now it's there's a clarity too of what's possible. So I, I think it's probably the biggest shift. Yeah. Um what are your thoughts on federal regulations around AI development? I feel like this was planted by someone I know. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think uh, I was just talking to Kevin backstage a little bit about this. Um, I would be very cautious of jumping on the bandwagon of anyone who is raising red flags that isn't building artificial intelligence. Um, and if you look at GPT-4 as an example, the example I gave to Kevin, um, 
the reason GPT-4 is better is actually because it is safer and more aligned. It is not because, just because it's larger. We all, we've all seen the meme around the parameter size, and that is not what has made it better. It's because they took an enormous amount of effort to be able to adjust the weights of that model to be better at responding to your questions in a more effective and safer way. Is it perfect? No. But the reason you enjoy using it more than GPT-3 is because it's safer and more aligned. What that means is that the work to be able to create better models is the exact same work to be able to make them safer. They are not two distinct things. The folks that view them as such just are simply charlatans in my mind. So does that mean there shouldn't be thought and energy put into alignment and safety? No, there should be an enormous amount of thought put into it. Uh, I would just be very careful around who you hitch your wagon to right now. And if they're not a builder or somebody who understands these systems, um, that would cause me alarm. Yeah. Okay. Most important question is, have you encountered any scary or funny hallucinations while working with AI that you could share with us? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think I have any that I could share. Um, <laughs> but uh, may, maybe the funniest was uh, we have an e-commerce company who has a reputation for... Uh, delivering products that don't meet the expectations of their customers. Um, there's memes around it. And as we uh, started to be able to see some of the initial topics that derived uh, that we were able to create, uh, it was like we were looking at Giphy or memes uh, around that very thing. But not, other than that, there's probably not stuff I can share. That <laughs> it's probably more on the inappropriate side. <laughs> more personal. Yeah. OK, well, let's give uh, Nate another round of applause. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nate. Sure. Thank you.